We can all imagine approximately the physical structure of the processor. There are several compute cores, a cache where frequently used data is stored, various controllers and buses for information exchange. All this beauty can be seen even without a microscope if you carefully remove the top layer of the die. But how does all this silicon physics work? What are processor instructions? How are they related to threads and processes? Why is it so difficult to make software run in parallel across several cores and the benefit from hyperthreading is far from the theoretical twofold? This is MK. Today we will explain in simple language the logical structure of processors and video chips. And let us start with the basics, namely processor instructions. Many have heard such names as SSE, AVX, or even MMX. But what is this? In simple terms, a set of instructions is just a list of commands understandable to the processor that tell it how to best solve the task assigned to it. In the mid-80s, the best Intel 386 processors in terms of their development were somewhere around the first graders. They could easily add 2 and 3, but decimals were already too much for them. In order to solve this, Intel developed a coprocessor called 80387SX, which only had instructions for working with floating point numbers. That's how the first extension for the x86 instruction set appeared, which was called x87. And I don't even need to tell you how much it changed the game. But as time went on, computing appetites grew, and in the late 90s, when releasing the Pentium, Intel decided to add support for MMX vector instructions to it. And they even put it in the name. So what is a vector? In mathematics, it is the next level above numbers, namely their order set. In other words, it is a one-dimensional data array. Today, a lot of computational tasks work with vectors and not ordinary numbers. For example, they are used in 3D modeling, for keying the video stream when working with green screen and alpha channel, and even just when playing multimedia, and in games of course. And it is such tasks that could be accelerated by using the MMX instructions, and this principle was called SIMD, that is, single instruction, multiple data. Later, more advanced and at the same time simple instructions for programmers appeared, such as SSE and AVX. The former was a logical continuation of MMX, which now was connected to a coprocessor and could work with floating point numbers. The AVX instructions are a further development of SSE, which can work with a large amount of data per clock cycle, but the general purpose of vector instructions has not changed. Such additional instruction sets can load special units and processors, which leads to a faster solution of a certain type of a task. And if they continue to name them the same way they did with the X87, now the entire list of instructions would end with X2087 or even more. But why add more and more instructions? The freshly released AVX512 consumes the transistor budget and is very hot. And such tasks where this instruction set provides a huge benefit, which is mostly AI, is not something a regular user would do a lot. But if AVX512 is the future of computing, the benefit from the regular AVX can be seen literally everywhere. For example, Blender, which is used by animators and game makers, actively relies on vectors, and working with it, the popular Pentium processors are 30% slower than the similar by cores and clock speeds Core i3s. Precisely because there are no AVX instructions in Pentium, the software is forced to use the slower SSE. Now instructions being sorted out, it's time to go to the next level of this pyramid, the operating system. It cannot directly control the instruction the silicon holds, so it uses so-called threads. In a nutshell, a thread is a minimum computational task that the system can send to the processor, and then the processor will decompose it into instructions that it understands. It would make more sense to call these threads sub-processes, but we call them threads thanks to Viktor Vysotsky an American mathematician and cyberneticist who introduced the term in the 60s. However, for the user, the thread is still an inaccessible level. The system allows us to control only regular processes that we see in the task manager. So what is the difference between a thread and a process? Processes are at the top of the computing pyramid, and they can include dozens or hundreds of threads. At the same time, the threads within one process can use the same resources, such as memory, whereas higher-level processes use separate resources. A good analogy here is the factory assembly, for example, of a cell phone. The information in the worker's brain about how to properly tighten the screw is the process instruction. The screwing process itself is a thread. And the whole assembly line is a process. 
and that is why the system does not allow us to directly control the thread. After all, if we put the wrong screw on the table or take it away, the entire assembly process will be disrupted and cell phones will come out defective. But since the user is still in charge, we can stop the assembly line by killing the entire process, which is what the task manager allows us to do. A good example for understanding is any web browser, such as Chrome for example. When it starts, it creates several internal processes, as well as a separate process for each new tab. We can see all of them in the task manager built into Chrome. At the same time, you can kill any tab process and the browser will continue its operation without any issues. Now open the YouTube tab and start watching videos on my computer channel after having subscribed of course. The process of this tab will create several threads for playing video, audio, rendering subtitles, etc. And here the system does not allow us to interact with such threads and it makes sense. For example, by killing the audio thread, the video will become mute. And if we kill the video thread, it will turn into a podcast. And then the question arises. Since we can see hundreds of processes and thousands of threads in the task manager, how does the processor cope with all of them at the same time? The short answer is, it doesn't. Just like 70 years ago, we still run only one thread at a time on one logical core. Yes, all these thousands of threads do not run simultaneously, but since their execution takes minuscule fractions of a millisecond, it tricks us into thinking that it does. But still, the number of threads generated by the system and software is constantly growing. If Windows XP created only a few hundred threads, Windows 10 creates a couple of thousand. But the core count is not growing as much. Two core CPUs are still quite widespread. Does it mean that there are some kind of tricks that allow us to compute faster? Yes, and it's been so for a long time. Already in the 60s, engineers realized that the restriction of one thread per core is an issue, and something needs to be done about it. This is how superscalar processors appeared, which were able to execute several instructions on one core at the same time. There was no magic. It was just that several identical compute units were now included in each core, which made it possible to get a kind of multi-core inside one core. Interestingly, the first superscalar computer in the USSR was Elbrus, which is the great-great-grandfather of the modern Elbrus processors that are used today. In the case of the x86 processors, Intel was the first to introduce this with their Pentium. The old-timers remember how much faster they were than the 486. But you can't just keep copy-pasting these compute units and call it a day. Therefore, engineers came up with a trick called branch prediction. The idea here is that a lot of threads contain instructions like if this happens, then do this. Otherwise, do this. In order to do it properly, you need to calculate the input data in order to understand which way to go. But why do it if you can just play a guessing game? Although, of course, in reality, everything is a little more complicated than that. Branch prediction is specifically trained to offer the most likely result. This is not exactly a wild guess. As a result, if the guess turns out to be correct, it saves the processor precious microseconds. But if it didn't work out, the processor will have to reset the pipeline and calculate everything again, which of course will take longer. Therefore, the branch prediction module is constantly being developed to minimize the number of errors and thereby speed up the processor instead of slowing it down. But still it did not remove the main problem, one thread per core. The solution to this problem was invented by Intel in 2002 when Pentium processors with simultaneous multi-threading or SNT came out. The company called this technology the marketing name hyperthreading, whereas Team Red calls it multi-threading. But it is basically the same thing. How does multi-threading work? Let's get back to our assembly line with workers. If there's only one person, then the efficiency would suck. The assembly line would be idle for a huge portion of time. But if you add another person, the utilization of the conveyor belt will increase by a lot. With the processor core, everything is similar. While one thread of the Premier process renders video in the AVX instruction unit, nothing prevents a second thread from using the SSE unit, for example, to calculate the remaining rendering time. To do this, in processors with SMT starting with Pentium 4, there is a hardware module that monitors whether it is possible to add another thread to the one that the processor is currently performing. At the same time, it barely consumes the transistor budget, occupying at most 5% of the die. But these 5% are well worth it. One physical core turns into a pair of logical ones. However, that does not mean that when multi-threading or hyper-threading is enabled, the processor becomes twice as fast. In fact, the increase is much more modest. And sometimes it doesn't exist at all or it may even harm the performance. 
For example, if the software is old or poorly optimized, it can load only a few consecutive cores. Therefore, disabling SMT may even increase performance, since in this case, each thread of such software will use its own physical core and will not share the logical ones with another. There is also such a thing as conflict over resources. If the program places great demands on the cache or RAM, then they become a bottleneck and seriously slow down another thread on the same physical core. And that is why there is a profit from overclocking memory, since in this case accessing it will happen faster, which will speed up the calculation threads or at least expand this bottleneck. That is why in games, Ryzen processors with an L3 cache of 100 megabytes, which is a fast buffer between CPU and RAM, they turn out to be very fast. And Intel is also constantly increasing L3 cache volumes in their CPUs. Another interesting question is why hyperthreading has not changed in 20 years. And even modern x86 processors use only two threads per core. After all, hundreds of workers can be put to work in one assembly line. Why not make four logical cores per one physical, for instance? This has actually been done a long time ago, in server processors such as Xeon Phi or IBM Power 10, where they normally have eight threads per core. Only in desktop processors with a fairly short pipeline and tasks being too diverse, this is more likely to harm performance rather than increase it, since threads will wait for a long time for their turn. Unlike in servers where tasks are often the same and quite predictable, which allows them to be packed tightly. This is easy to check in the CPU-Z benchmark. Thus, if we take an 8-core, 8 8-thread 8 9700K processor, we get almost perfect parallelization. Physical cores do not interfere with each other, so the result in a multi-core test turns out to be almost 8 times faster than the single core. But if we take a 9900K, which already has 16 threads, then we will not see a 16-fold increase in performance, only 10. Under heavy loads, two threads on the same core are forced to fight for resources. Therefore, although the increase is not bad, about 20%, it is far from the theoretical twofold. And that is why it makes no sense to make three or four threads in consumer-grade CPUs. And the last important question is why even now, when there are 32 thread processors, there is still software that loads only one or two cores. After all, even if you look inside the process of an old game using the utility called Process Explorer, you will be able to see a dozen threads. What is the problem with scattering them across multiple cores? It's all about how those games were written. These games were created in the era of the single core processors, so they have one main thread for a single core. Of course, such games do have additional threads, but in Process Explorer, it is clearly visible that their load of processor is minimal. Therefore, if the system transfers them to other cores, it will hardly be noticeable even when monitoring, while the main thread will still utilize one core. Therefore, there is no way to run this kind of software in parallel unless completely rewritten. For comparison, modern games that are developed with multi-core processors in mind can have a couple of dozen threads with a comparable load on the cores, which allows them to be perfectly parallelized. Central processors dealt with, let us take a look at another interesting computer component, a video card. Take for example the top-end Radeon RX 7900 XTX. It has 96 compute units, each of which can execute 64 threads. As a result, we get as many as 6144 threads, three orders more than in the best desktop processors. How is this possible? Because in conventional CPUs, multi-threading stops at two threads per core, and eight in case of servers. It's all about the approach. While processors work with many different instructions from completely unrelated threads, GPUs are designed to execute the same threads from the same processes. Maximum identity, which allows you to turn a video chip into a full-fledged analog of a modern factory where 50 workers can work behind one conveyor belt. We have sorted out the past and the present, so what does the future hold? In the case of graphics cards, we can expect further growth in multi-threading due to optimization. If the GeForce GT 9000 lineup had only 8 threads per compute unit and the GTX 400 had 48, the latest RTX 1490 already offers 128 threads per unit. With processors, everything is more complicated. Yes, there were rumors that the Ryzen 5000 should have received support for quad threading, but we don't see it even in the 7000 lineup. And this is expected. More and more new instructions appear in processors every year, and therefore it is more and more difficult to make them work together on the same core. In ordinary tasks, even two-thread hyperthreading is unlikely to yield an extra 20 to 30% of performance, which puts an end to the further development of this technology.
On the other hand, it's not particularly important, as long as there's still possibility to provide performance gains by brute force, by an increase in the number of cores and clock speeds. The former allows you to work with a large number of threads at the same time, and the latter allows you to do it faster. In addition, Intel demonstrated a new way a year ago, running background threads on small, energy-efficient cores. Similarly, new instructions are increasingly entering our lives. There are already enough games that require the CPU to support AVX, while the latest AVX 512 is quite good at accelerating the PlayStation 3 emulator. So although the end of Silicon is getting closer, of which we have already told you, there is still some potential for further development. Despite the fact that we have chosen a rather complex topic, we have tried to simplify it as much as possible so that it's clear to you. I hope we succeeded. If you're interested in the physics of the processor, watch one of our previous videos. This was MK, my name is Mikhail Krashen, I'll see you later. Bye.